Today, billions of photos are taken every day. It is the best method of capturing moments that will never be experienced again, preserving and sharing them with others. Since its development in the first half of the 19th century, photography has been considered a medium of representing visible reality in the most accurate way possible. It even enabled some painters and sculptors to completely abandon the long-held idea of realistically representing nature and pave the way for modern art. However, could this notion be wrong? Could photography be used to represent something intangible and impermanent as a human soul? These questions were posed during the 19th century, most notably by the Swedish artist August Strindberg. Johan August Strindberg was a Swedish writer and playwright born in Stockholm in 1849. August's early childhood was spent in emotional insecurity, poverty and neglect. He studied at the University of Uppsala and the Institute of Technology in Stockholm, preparing for a medical career. But after failing the chemistry examination, he became disillusioned with formal education. As a student, he financed himself as a freelance journalist and had already started working on his first drama, Master Olog, published in 1872. Two years later, he became a librarian at the Royal Library and in 1877 began an intense relationship and eventually disastrous marriage with Siri von Essen. The last decade of the 19th century presented a rough period for both the writer and his artistic pursuits. It was a period of psychological turmoil and writer's block, from which a new way of expression emerged. In a period of loneliness, alcoholism, unemployment, alchemy and theosophy, new works such as Inferno and To Damascus emerged. The plays he wrote in this period were precursors to modern theatre and expressionist drama. August Strindberg passed away on the 14th of May 1912 in Stockholm at the age of 63. Despite being primarily a literary figure and remembered as such, Strindberg is a complex figure who dabbled into the visual art world as well, leaving behind some paintings and even more photographs. August Strindberg's interest in photography was awakened at a very young age in the early 1860s after being allowed to borrow his cousin's camera. The early photographs he made have not survived, but his interest in natural science and experimentation began around the same time. These two fields captivated Strindberg throughout his life and were often related to each other. For Strindberg, photography was a fruitful medium for exploring the relationship between science and art. When he pointed the camera towards himself, questions of subjectivity, the soul and life and death emerged. The motivation for making images of himself that would eventually be published came in 1886. After facing backlash for his misogyny, creating these self-portraits was sparked by the need for more control over his public image. However, at the same time, they are also a way of exploring the self in a way that would be scientific and objective. During the 1890s, the writer came up with the ultimately unfulfilled idea of establishing a photographic studio specializing in psychological portraits. The photography process in the studio would have included a partly occultist working method and the use of camera obscura or a dark room with a small hole or lens, which was supposed to enhance the subject's psychological qualities. He did not like to use lenses and preferred to use simple self-made devices. In one instance, he made a camera out of a cigar box with no lenses. Together with the Swedish photographer Hermann Andersson, he constructed the Wunderkamera, a type of photographic device meant for life-size portraits. In 1886, Strindberg moved to Gersau in Switzerland together with Siri and their three children. He quickly started taking photos of their family life with a recently purchased camera. Little information remains about the photographic process. Siri took some of them, and some were taken with delayed shutters, but all were staged and directed by Augustus. This is the reason why they are considered self-portraits. These photographs show the artist posing in different roles, as a writer, musician, father, husband, gentleman, and bohemian artist. All 18 images were accompanied by text that gives an extra autobiographical layer. The text refers to the subject's thoughts rather than actual speech, emphasizing interiority. Sometimes the relationship between the images and the text seems arbitrary. In the photo of Strindberg playing the guitar, the text reads, It doesn't help to eat grass. 
This is a direct quotation from Strindberg's own story, Development. Several other captions are literary references, as in the Gardener one, which has the following text. Well, we have to become gardeners, from Voltaire's Candide. The texts create confusion between the inner and outer by inviting the viewer to imagine that these captions convey what the subject was thinking when the photograph was taken. Despite the seeming spontaneity of these images, they also contain an element of darkness and silence. Strindberg looks directly at the camera and poses self-consciously in all of them. A smile breaks no single portrait and the atmosphere remains deadly earnest. In the Gersau photographs, Strindberg remained in the naturalistic project of recording reality in detail to capture the world's essence. However, at the beginning of the 1890s and his so-called Inferno period, he became increasingly interested in penetrating the surface of the visible world in order to grasp what goes on underneath it, which aligns with the prevailing notions of European culture in general. In his writing career, Strindberg experienced a type of writer's block. Naturalism led him to a dead end, and the way out was changing how he perceived the world. As Strindberg explains in one of his letters, photographic experiments had a decisive role in this endeavor. I've thought of becoming a photographer to save my talent, as a writer. His visual art project was brought up to a new level with a mixture of science, occultism, and alchemy. In an increasingly experimental process, the writer strove to reveal the invisible sources of life through chemical investigation, including photographic techniques. Even the last self-portrait he had taken in 1906 reflects the occultist attitude of searching for one's soul. Without going too much into Strindberg's occult and pseudo-scientific interests that mirrored the ones in European culture, he believed in invisible energies and that photographs could contain some telepathic power. These later photographic activities are based on a method and attitude that, in a certain sense, is opposite to the Gersau series. Instead of a series of different aspects of his personality, these photos were attempts to capture the fundamental nature of oneself in one single image. In them, there is a minimization of all naturalistic details in order to reveal the essence of the self or the soul. Several photographic self-portraits remain from the early 1890s and exhibit solid psychological tension. The image in which Strindberg faces the viewer directly has a strangely hypnotic and daunting effect. A stern and dark figure wrapped inside a black overcoat, with a gaze turned inward and dark shadows lingering on his brow. At the beginning of the 20th century, Strindberg gave up painting altogether, and his visual art pursuits were honed almost completely on photography. He decided to create life-size portraits with Herman Anderson, who also had alchemical leanings. He believed that the face-to-face -face quality of these images allowed the communion between souls. The inspiration for these photographs were probably Anderson's essays on the philosophy of photography, in one of which he explores the question of the soul in the medium. All of these self-portraits and photographs have in common the belief that the subject's essence doesn't reside in his likeness and that a fundamental core of the self exists beneath the surface. August Strindberg had never trained as a painter and had a limited ability to paint human beings. A camera offered him a way of presenting himself in a way that literature could not. After the first naturalistic portraits, he truly wanted to capture the soul. As such, his attempts are related to the contemporary pursuits of photographing spirits and finding scientific proof for the existence of the soul. As works of art, his photographic self-portraits take part in the process of dematerialization, a central element of art at the fin de siècle.